Good afternoon. My name is John Blades. I'm the director of the Flagler Museum, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all here this afternoon for the sixth and final lecture in this year's the 27th annual Whitehall Lecture Series. I want to take just a couple of minutes to uh, do a couple things here. First of all, I'll remind you if you have a cell phone, please take a second to make sure it's actually off so that it doesn't surprise us in the middle of the lecture. And if the staff failed to um, uh, take your audio tour one as you came in, please hold that up so the staff can come and collect that now. The audio tour ones are sometimes, they have built-in alarms and sometimes they're set off by the audio-visual system in this room and believe me, they'll wake the dead if they go off. Um, these lectures are webcast, so I want to welcome not only those of you who are present, but those of you who are joining us live via the internet. And just as a reminder, um, these lectures are available to anyone worldwide via the internet. Those of, the, uh, those of us, those of you who join us via the internet can see the same slides the live audience can see, or the, pres the, the real audience can see, I guess, the, the audience that's present, and not that those of you joining us via the internet aren't real. Um, <coughs> just can't see you. Um, and you can hear the uh, live audio as well, and then even ask questions at the end of the lecture. And all of our lectures are uh, then later edited in with live or with video that's being recorded at this point so that uh, they become part of the permanent record and you can go back and view lectures you've missed or lectures you've been to but want to see again uh, on the museum's website. I want to thank our education department staff for putting this lecture together uh, and all of the lectures of this series. And I want to thank our sponsors, the Palm Beach Post, and the Daphne Siebel George Foundation for helping to make this possible. The theme of this year's lecture series was the great, is the great engineering feats of the Gilded Age, and the reason for the theme this year is to help put Henry Flagler's Oversea Railroad in context. The completion of the Oversea Railroad, which was just a little over 100 years ago, uh, was the most, it was the completion of the most ambitious engineering feat ever undertaken by a private citizen. And we thought it would be interesting to help put that feat in the context of other great engineering feats of the time. And there were many to choose from. So thus far in the lecture series, we talked about not only the Oversea Railroad, we talked about Ferris's amazing wheel, something that's become a part of every fair <coughs> for more than 100 years now. We talked about the tunnels under the Hudson River that uh, Pennsylvania Railroad built to get into Manhattan. We've talked about Mulholland's aqueduct, the, the thing that made the giant metropolis of Los Angeles possible. And last week we talked about the Titanic, not Titanic the disaster, but Titanic the engineering marvel, the greatest ship of its time. And we'll conclude our series today with a discussion on the Panama Canal. Here to help us uh, understand this amazing, amazing engineering project is Matthew Parker. Matthew was born in Central America and has spent uh, a part of his childhood in the West Indies. Uh, he has a long, lifelong fascination with his region. He's a graduate of Oxford University. He's worked as a writer, editorial consultant, and a contributor to many television projects. He has books on Monte Cassino, uh, Panama. His book, Panama Fever, released here in the U.S. under that name, was released in England under Hell's Gorge, I think was the name of it in England, right? And he's also just released a book on uh, the sugar barons, the sugar in industry in the West Indies. He was a consultant on the Panama Canal, an episode for PBS's American Experience, and I understand he's working on a, a centennial program for, is it the BBC, Matthew? Yeah, the BBC, so, which will probably be aired here in the US as well. Um, he lives in London with his wife, Hannah, and their three children, and according to his website, also an annoying dog. I haven't asked him about his <laughs> annoying dog, but he, his wife is here with him, and, and it's a pleasure to have you here as well. Please join me in welcoming Matthew Parker to the Biology. Hello, good 
afternoon. Um, first of all, I just wanted to check that everyone can hear me at the back and that I don't need to adjust the, the microphone. Is that all right in the back? A little more. How, how's that? Is that better or is that going to echo and give everyone a earache? Is that okay? Um, first of all, it's a, a huge privilege and honour to be invited here. Um, thank you very much to John Blades and Alison Goff for bringing me all the way from London um, to a bit of Florida sunshine. Um, it's obviously we're approaching the centenary of the Panama Canal um, and it's, I think it's fascinating to look at the story in the light of the Gilded Age in America in whose extraordinary temple we are today. The Gilded Age, of course, saw the United States assuming industrial leadership of the world and all over America and Europe, where the time was known as the Belle Epoque, people's lives and aspirations were being transformed by massive technological advances, railroads, telegraphs, steamers, and of course many, many more. This age is cutting edge technology, and perhaps just as importantly, the huge confidence that it inspired was poured into the Panama Canal effort, which can be seen perhaps as its greatest, most spectacular manifestation. But as one writer puts it, the Gilded Age also saw, and I quote, business ventures encouraged that today would be decried as damaging to the environment, unfair or dangerous for workers, questionable in terms of relations with other nations, and heedless of the rights and privileges of certain other groups. The Panama Canal story, of course, has all of this darker side of the age as well. Mark Twain, the coiner, of course, of the phrase the Gilded Age, wrote that history does not repeat itself, but it does rhyme. <laughs> such, such rhyme or historical echoes are everywhere in the Panama story. Some of the history is, of course, immensely inspiring. It was, after all, the most ambitious construction project since the Great Pyramids and the greatest victory of man over nature until the moon landings. But an awful lot of it is cautionary. In ways that are surely relevant today, with a five and a half billion dollar mega project to double the capacity of the canal now underway in Panama. This is a massively important project, not just for Panama, but for almost, for almost all the structure of world trade. I gather that the Port of Miami director has given the go ahead to a two billion dollars improvement to cope with the post Panamax vessels it hopes to attract. Echoes, perhaps, or rhymes of Henry Flagler's dream for Key West the subject, of course, of an earlier lecture in the series. The Panama story has a dazzling cast of heroes and villains, idealists and conmen, sometimes all manifested in the same person. <laughs> but I also want to share with you something that I think has been less well covered by previous canal historians, the lived experience of construction, what it was like to actually be there. To that end, I looked at diaries, letters and contemporary newspapers and wove into the book a number of personal narratives of ordinary people involved in this extraordinary moment in history. And today I also want to give you a little bit of a flavour of a few of those. The canal's history, of course, starts right back in 1513 with the discovery of the Pacific Ocean by the Spanish conquistador Balboa. Here you can see him claiming the sea for the King of Spain. The dogs, by the way, were there to frighten off the Indians, who had actually claimed two-thirds of his party before they reached the Pacific. <laughs> this crucial discovery was linked to another one, of course, that the two oceans were separated by a tantalizingly narrow isthmus, sometimes as, a, as, as narrow as 30 to 40 miles. So the discovery launched a 400-year quest to join the oceans. One of Balboa's party actually suggested that should a, a strait through, through to the east not be found, it might be possible to make one. A survey actually followed before 1520, which pretty much followed the route of the current canal. Thankfully, in the light of what happened later, work was never started. Already, though, the canal dream can be seen to be attracting hubristic delusions. One engineer, when challenged about the high and thickly jungled mountains between the seas, wrote to the King of Spain, if there are mountains, there are also hands. To a King of Spain, with the wealth of the Indies at his disposal, when the object to be attained is the spice trade, what is possible is easy. Indeed, a, instead, a road was built to carry the Inca gold 
uh, across to the Atlantic and thence to Europe. This made Panama a transit hub, generating huge wealth and strategic importance and attracting Spain's enemies in great numbers. But the lure of the Isthmus was not just about plunder. At the end of the 17th century, as any Scottish people here will know, a Scottish promoter, William Patterson, returned from the Caribbean, where he'd been working as part missionary, part buccaneer, which seems like a, a slightly curious job share. <laughs> um, he, he, but he returned in the grip of a great idea. He'd been told of a place just south of, of Panama, where there were few Spaniards and low valleys from coast to coast. Pa Patterson promised that the setting up of a Scottish colony in transit, and even in time a canal, would deliver to his country the gates to the Pacific and the keys to the universe. Trade will beget trade, he declared, and money beget money. The result, of course, was the ruin of Scotland, the end of its existence as an independent state, and the deaths of more than 2,000 settlers. Patterson wasn't the only dreamer. The Isthmus would have this effect on many others. Even in the midst of the American Revolution, Benjamin Franklin, then the United Colonies representative in Paris, became gripped by the idea of a transitmian canal. In 1781, he printed on his own press a pamphlet written by a French peasant called Pierre Gargaz, which advocated the cutting of canals at Panama and Suez. Gargaz, this, Gargaz proposed, would bring about world peace through enhanced communication and commerce. When Thomas Jefferson became United States Minister to France, he too became gripped by the idea of a canal at Panama. This, though, was for more pragmatic reasons. He saw the expansion of power southwards of the United States as its national destiny. And this conflict between idealism and hard-headed pragmatism is, I think, a key to understanding the richness of the Panama story. It was the 1820s, however, when this began to become a little bit more realistic. For one thing, the dead hand of Spanish rule had been lifted. It was the canal age in Europe and America. The Erie Canal had been built, Telford's Caledonian Canal in Scotland, and steam power had arrived, um, which of course allowed um, vessels to transit a canal without the need for towpaths. An influential book published about this time by a German explorer declared a transitmian canal not only possible, but that it would immortalize a government interested with the sorry, occupied with the interest of humanity. He even gave some possible routes, as you can see here. This new enthusiasm produced a stream of optimistic surveyors and explorers from the United States, Britain, France, Italy, Denmark, and Holland. <coughs> Their backers were sometimes private companies, sometimes kings or emperors. It was an idea, it seemed, that once taken on, became an obsession. Some called it canal-itis. Most of the explorers got lost, perished from hunger or disease, or were massacred or turned back by the region's hostile Kuna Indians. They compensated, or the survivors compensated for their failures by telling their backers they had found a, a mystical lost canal or a remarkable depression in the continental divide, the rocky spine, of course, that links the great mountain ranges of North and South America. Telford himself um, proposed a grand scheme for a canal at Darien. The great idea of the canal now attracted not only proven engineers such as Telford, but almost all the millionaires, dreamers, amateur engineers, and crackpots of the 19th century. With the canal, the great unfulfilled engineering challenge of the world, the Isthmus remained the focus of international great power rivalry. In the 1840s, it almost brought war between Britain and the United States, only averted when the two powers agreed in a treaty in 1850 that neither would build a canal on their own. Particularly for the Americans, no canal was better than a canal under the control of a hostile, potentially hostile power. It was a railway, of course, being built between 1850 and 1855 from Colón on the Atlantic to Panama City at huge cost in money and lives, in the main by workers from China and Jamaica under American leadership. From the California gold rush until the opening of the transcontinental railroads in 1869, the quickest way to travel from the east coast of America to the west coast was through Panama. In his first address to Congress in 1869, new President Ulysses Grant laid out his canal ambitions, which he described as indispensable to the interests of the US, part of its manifest destiny. 
and Grant soon established a new commission to investigate possibilities and conduct and weigh surveys of all these possible routes. They looked at each one and concluded that the best spot was a canal at Nicaragua using the High Lake. But the treaty with Britain and also the lack of a strong US Navy to defend a future canal tied their hands. Into this en passe snuck a French company, launching in the 1880s what would result in one of history's greatest ever engineering disasters. I want to say a little bit better about this because I think it's important to give context to what could have happened with the American effort um, and also to, uh, it underlines the extraordinary achievement of the American engineers and also it paints, it, it shows us what Panama, Panama was like, the reputation it had when the Americans arrived in 1903 to 4. The place stank of death, disgrace, corruption and vice. So why did the French undertake this project? As for the Scots, it was about national pride. France had been humiliated by Prussia in 1870 and saw the project as a way of recovering prestige, or as Victor Hugo put it, astonishing the world with great deeds that can be won without a war. The embodiment of this spirit of revanche was the builder of the Suez Canal, Ferdinand de Lesseps, the Le Grand Français, as he was known. And here you see him as Hercules separating the continents of Africa and Asia. The canal brought India 6,000 miles closer to Europe and embodied all that was exciting about commerce, industry and entrepreneurship, the forces that were changing the world. It was also seen as a great civilizing achievement. One commentator wrote, it would help web the whole universe into one great unit, politically, industrially and religiously. Here you see Deleceps with his second wife and some of his enormous brood. Although he was in his mid-sixties when the Suez Canal opened, he was the embodiment of virility, siring endless children, and not just with his wife, as an admiring French public noticed. <laughs> not content with Suez, now de Lesseps set his sight on an Isthmian canal. In a spirit of can-do optimism, with amazing tunnels and bridges underway in Europe and the United States, money was raised, explorers sent to the Isthmus, a concession obtained from Colombia, of which, of course, Panama was then a part, and at an international conference in Paris, a sea-level canal at Panama was decided on, thanks to the mesmeric influence of de Lesseps. American delegates at the conference, committed to a lock canal at Nicaragua, condemned, rightly as it turned out, the whole show as a comedy of the most deplorable kind. The greatest problem the Americans had identified in the Grand Surveys of Panama seemed to be the river, the River Chagras. You can see it looking rather sort of calm and peaceful. But Panama is one of the wettest places on earth. For eight months of the year, during the wet season, um, two inches had been known to fall in one hour. As a result, the river could rise up to 30 yards in the same time. If the canal ran along its valley, then it would have to provide drainage for the, this whole area. The, the French plan was to hold back the river at Gamboa with a, a large dam there. But as you can see, lots of other rivers flowed into the canal prism. These were to be kept from the canal by diversion channels, shown here as dotted lines. But as the canal ran along the lowest part of the river valley, the surface water of these diversions would be about 70 feet above that of the canal. In effect, as a critic of the French plan put it, the water would have to be hung up on the side of the mountains. Mm -hmm. The French public were told it was their patriotic duty to back the canal with cash, and they did so in their tens and hundreds of thousands. De Lesseps also tried to raise money in the United States and Britain. The Americans were in fact infuriated that the French should be meddling in what they saw as their backyard, so no money was forthcoming from them. In Britain, de Lesseps was applauded for his achievements at Suez, but the, his Panama plans were cold-shouldered. It is magnificent, wrote the Times newspaper, but it is not business. This slight feeling of heroic unreality pervades the French era in Panama. Here is a young Frenchman called Henri Samoise, who was amongst the first arrivals in, in Panama in 1881. He was 22 years old and had recently qualified as an engineer. Samoise's account of his journey to Panama is full of excitement and exuberance. After a storm in the Atlantic, on the 16th day of the journey, they entered calm seas. It became hot and sunny, 
and the air was now charged with the perfumes of tropical earth. At last the steerer neared Colon. All that morning the passengers remained on deck, excitedly scanning the horizon with their binoculars. Soon a long blue blurred line appeared in the distance. Then, little by little, the wooded summits of the isthmus came into view. Everyone became quiet. A great thoughtfulness took hold of us all, writes Samoas. Silently, we thought of these lands where we were going to engage in the great scientific battle, and where, like in all battles, there would be the wounded and the dead. In Paris, the Lesseps was telling anyone who would listen that Panama was an extremely healthy place, and the suggestions it was rife with tropical fever were an invention of our adversaries. Nevertheless, Samoas seems to have been aware that, of, of the huge personal risk he was taking. He knew, as he wrote, that he, he ran the risk of meeting yellow fever nose to nose. Me ba, he wrote, he was going all the same. And those words, me ba, for me, epitomize the bravery and foolhardiness of the French years. Whatever de Lesse had said, it was common knowledge that Panama was an extremely dangerous posting. But like a young man volunteering for a service in a war, there existed for Samoas and his contemporaries a belief, firstly, that the worst was all, would always happen to someone else. The second, that their country, and importantly, the general progress of humanity, demanded that they take the risk. At the end of the day, amazingly, they were prepared to die for the great idea of the canal. Once landed, someone was given the choice to work in the headquarters or out in the field. For him, the idea of the virgin forest with tigers, crocodiles, swirled round in my head. The life of a pioneer penetrating into the unexplored depths of the isthmus was an irresistible temptation. The next day, with a friend from the boat over, he was sent to a small work camp at, camp at Gamboa, where the river Chagras, what Samoas called, with good reason, the implacable enemy of our great enterprise, met the proposed line of the canal. The men were charged with mapping the site of the proposed dam. It was immediately apparent to Samoas that the work would have nothing in common with what one does in Europe. When we saw the thick forest which covered the mountains, we were thoroughly daunted. In Europe, comments Samoas, the work could have been done in a morning. But here in the tropical forest, it was another matter altogether. The jungle was so thickly matted that it was, you could only see a few yards in any direction, hopeless for taking measurements. The heat and humidity, like a steam bath, sapped the strength, making legs and arms heavy as stone. Few animals, apart from the old parrot, were encountered in the jungle, but there were plenty of snakes. Most feared were the coral snake and the giant bushmaster. The locals seemed adept at dispatching them with one blow of their machete, but it still required constant alertness as huge specimens could fall on the men from branches above their heads. The team of Europeans became very close and somewhat enjoyed the challenge of the work despite the privations. Everyone got stomach illnesses from drinking the river water, fevers came and went, vampire bats and tarantulas that um, took to climbing down the ropes of their hammocks tormented them at night. The jungle also teemed with ticks and other small insects that would burrow under the skin to lay the LA eggs, threatening to cause gangrene. Evenings would be spent digging them out of one another. At night, the jungle came to life. Above all, there was an invasion of insects, Samoa's writes. With each step, one foot crushed hundreds of them. With each movement of the hand, one picked up a fistful. With each nod, one's face brushed swirls of them flying in the darkness. One breathed them in as one went along. Moreover, the flame of a lamp was extinguished within minutes under the heap of their small corpses. A monstrous buzzing filled the forest and rose all the way to the sky, while in this clear tropical night the huge trees flamed with millions of fireflies. This, this sense of wonder and idealism pervades the whole French era, but few of these young Frenchmen survived. By 1884, there was a pretty much permanent epidemic of yellow fever on the isthmus. It's been estimated that three out of four of the French engineers who set out to be part of Ferdinand de Lesseps heroic dream were dead within three months. Yellow fever is an almost uniquely distressing and frightening disease. There's still no cure apart from treating the symptoms such as kidney failure. But in the 1880s, a strong adult would only have about an even chance of surviving an attack. At the time it was treated with whiskey, mustard seed, brandy and cigars. Caused by a small virus transmitted by certain mosquitoes, 
The early symptoms include headache, loss of appetite and muscle pain. A high temperature follows, accompanied by severe back pain, which some described as like being on the rack. After that comes a burning, agonizing thirst, the telltale jaundice as the eyes and skin yellow, and the dreaded vomito negro, vomiting up choking mouthfuls of dark blood as the virus caused liver and kidney failure and multi-organ dysfunction and hemorrhage. The brain is often affected as well, producing delirium, seizures and coma. The medical shock caused by extreme fluid loss can in itself be fatal. In the, in the 1880s, no one knew how the disease was transmitted. Some said it was caused by filth or dead animals, others by a certain wind off the sea. One doctor even suggested it came from eating apples. In the same way, of course, malaria was thought to be caused by miasma, toxic emanations from the rich corruption of tropical soil. One of the saddest stories of the French era is that of the Danglay family. That's Jules Danglay, seen here, arrived in Panama as the new chief engineer in early 1883, declaring that only the drunk and dissipated die of yellow fever. To prove that the disease held no fear for him, he brought his daughter, his son, his wife, and his daughter's fiancé with him. All were dead from yellow fever within 16 months. In fact, as many as 20,000 died during the French Canal period, the majority of them Jamaicans who provided the, the muscle for the effort. For some, this death all around, this sword of Damocles hanging over everyone, stoked even more this feeling of heroic unreality. The constant dangers of yellow fever, wrote one young, young engineer, exalted the energy of those who were filled with a sincere love for the great task undertaken. To its radiating influence was joined the heroic joy of self-sacrifice for the greatness of France. American observers on the isthmus took a more cynical line. To them, all this was so much Gallic hot air. As one American journalist wrote in um, 1887, and in one of my favorite quotes about Panama that is possibly applicable today, of what one hears in Panama, disregard one third, doubt one third, and disbelieve the other third. <laughs> the air is as rife with deception as with miasma. De Lesseps bribed the French press to the tune of 12 million francs to stay loyal as he tried to raise more money from investors, but this money got more and more expensive. As early as 1884, the local newspaper, the Panama Star and Herald, was goading the US government to take on the job. It would be a pity, it wrote, if, that such a work as this should be left partially completed as a monument of the folly and gullibility of capital. And here's a series of pictures from French Europe. This is the beginning. It was hoped that it would be miracle machines that would dig the canal. As you can see, it was mainly pick and shovel men. This was one of the machines that had built the Suez Canal. Um, but the heavy clays of the Chagras Valley were much harder work than the sands of, of Egypt. Here is about as close as it got to a miracle machine. These huge dredges were built in Philadelphia and towed down. Um, and they were actually run by an American company that was just about the most corrupt of all the contractors, um, which is really saying something. <laughs> Here you can see this is sort of much later on. This is, progress is being made, um, but there, there was no system. There was something like um, 11, different type, 11 different types of flat car running on six different gauges. And as they dug deeper, they started to encounter the problem of slides. And the French did eventually change to a lock plan, with locks designed by Gustave Eiffel, no less, but by then it was too late. But as the Delessis adventure slid towards catastrophe, the devil by disease and engineering problems, as well as floods, fire, civil war and earthquakes on the isthmus, everything that could go wrong went wrong. American technicians in Panama were convinced that their country would assume control of the enterprise. The British in Panama thought the same, that Panama would be taken over, Panama Canal would be taken over by Great Britain, just as the Suez Canal had recently been. But when it came to the crunch at the beginning of the 20th century, the American diplomats found their British counterparts embroiled in other problems, and at last willing to remove the restrictions of the 1850 treaty, thereby conceding to the United States hegemony over the Western Hemisphere. The American leadership under Theodore Roosevelt now moved with newfound aggression and ruthlessness to make the canal a reality. Amidst not a little intrigue, they bought out the French company and its concession for $40 million, a figure, of course, that dwarfs the purchases of Louisiana, um, Alaska, and the Philippines, 
when the Colombian government asked for some of this windfall and seemed unwilling to give in to the American demands that they hand over total control of a canal zone, Roosevelt, exercising presidential autonomy like never before, made plans to invade Panama, but then instead fomented, supported and protected a separatist revolution on the Isthmus. He then bullied the new Panama Republic into signing a treaty that reduced it to vassalage. In sharp contrast to the French period, total military control over a sovereign US canal zone was established. All this garnered huge criticism and unease back at home. Here's the, the take of the anti-imperialist New York world. There were fears that the United States, by stealing the canal zone in the most barefaced manner, had abandoned one of its founding principles and dragged itself down to the sordid level of the European land-grabbing powers. Might makes right steal from the weak, as one senator put it. It begins to look as if no one can touch that Panama ditch without being defiled, concluded one newspaper. But the canal was popular. <coughs> one Texas senator expressed the, explained the dilemma by telling the story of a dog catching a rabbit against its previous training. You might whip the dog, but would you throw away the rabbit? In the end, Congress approved the Canal Treaty, and public opinion, as expressed in the 1904 election where TR played the canal as a trump card, backed the president's fait accompli. The American Canal was to be publicly funded, one of the keys to its success. But there was nothing inevitable about the American Panama Canal. Early arrivals found it a very difficult and frightening place. Here's a young American woman called Rose Van Hardevelt coming against the advice of her family out to Panama with her two small children to join her husband Jan, who was already working there. Jan was a recent immigrant from Holland and he'd worked on railways in Wyoming and he loved his newly adopted country. He had a phrase, in America anything is possible. Of the canal, he said, we will succeed where the French failed so miserably. Like all new arrivals, Rose was shocked by the squalor of Cologne. And this is Bottle Alley, and there are 41 bars in this street, 131 in the town, described by the British Consul at the time as the hardest drinking and most immoral place I've ever known. Rose noticed the foul smell, the sea of rubbish, sewage, and greenish water. Everywhere there was the wreckage of the French effort quickly being reclaimed by the jungle. The isthmus was a giant scrap heap. She also saw acres of little white crosses falling over and rotting under the jungle of tropical growth. Leaving the train at Las Cascadas, Rose found herself, she writes, in the blackest, darkest place I've ever been in. Not one flicker of light shone anywhere. We stumbled over a number of wet, slippery tracks and walked along a boardwalk until we reached the steps of the house. This had obviously been long unoccupied. Furniture had been thrust through the door and left, and a large number of bats were living in the rafters. They had clearly been in residence for some years. A penetrating stench, so vile it was almost unbearable, hit them as soon as they went inside. Black lizards with bright yellow heads scurried for cover. The first priority was to get the children to sleep. Jan and Rose assembled two beds and covered them with a mosquito net as the house was unscreened. By the time I had undressed Janie and sister, writes Rose, they were both sobbing forlornly. The Americans learned little useful from the failure of the French from the canal's history. For the first two years, they even hoped to build a sea level waterway, which had been proven by the French to be impossible. Because of the ongoing fallout from Roosevelt's action, there was pressure to make the dirt fly, and excavation work started without proper preparation. Determined to avoid the corruption of the French years, the project was tied up in the most horrendous bureaucracy. William Gorgas, the commission's head doctor, who had successfully worked in Havana, on er in Havana in, um, eradicating yellow fever, was not believed about the new mosquito theory of transmission. Yellow fever inevitably arrived, and a panic broke out. Three quarters of the American workforce left. Accident, malaria, pneumonia, and violent clashes with Panamanians and Americans saw the West Indian workforce abandoning the project in droves. A year after the start, the project was on its knees. Rose, Rose stayed, but it got worse for her. Her husband, coming home wet and exhausted, was thinner and thinner. He was obsessed with the canal and very little help to his wife in her daily struggle to find food fit for consumption to get used to the heat, insects, and strange foreigners and terrible accommodation. 
and Rose had sleepless nights thanks to the noisy funeral lamentations that rose from the labour camp below their house, where death was becoming ever more frequent. Then their youngest daughter's sister fell seriously ill with a combination of malaria and dysentery. She became, Rose writes, a limp, feverish bundle, crying day and night. All the time, I was becoming lower in spirits and less able to cope, writes Rose. The thought of putting my baby in a strange hospital was the final straw. That night, I gave way to old-fashioned screaming hysterics outside beside the roaring cataract. Poor little Janie clung to me, her frightened eyes searching mine for cause of such carryings on. When a very close friend of theirs became one of the many victims of locomotive accidents, Rose found herself, she writes, drifting closer and closer to the yawning chasm of panic into which I had fallen before. And finally, much to my own disgust, I was put to bed with another spell of hysteria. The children haunted the bedside like frightened little shadows. I realised I must pull myself together. The new leadership of John C. Stevens, seen here in the Voter, from July 1905, put the project back on its feet. The foremost railway man of his day, Stevens had proved his tenacity in rough country from Canada to Mexico, surviving attacks by wolves and hostile Indians along the way. He was just TR's sort of rugged, ingenious and strenuous American. Although he would leave under a cloud, and two years later, Stevens' new plan of action would ultimately save the canal. The first thing he did was to stop all the publicity-driven excavation, the dirt flying, and concentrate his workforce on building accommodation and port facilities. And crucially, having identified fear of the yellow fever as wrecking the effort, he backed Gorgas, who now spent millions and had thousands working for him on his battle against the yellow fever mosquito. Stevens also realised that efficient transportation of the spoil away from the mountain was the key. He built an intricate factory-styled system of rails, signals, switches and rolling stock to provide a continuous conveyor belt for the excavators. It all took time and patience. On November the 11th, 1905, Dr. Gor Gorgas showed his team what he declared was the last yellow fever death they would ever see in Panama, and he was proved right. They then went to work on malaria. A morale-boosting visit by President Roosevelt at the end of 1906 the first time a serving US president had ever left the country, and the provision of new hospitals, clubhouses, restaurants, and clothes drying facilities for the, for, but, sorry, began to reassure the white workforce that they could survive in Panama. Most importantly, after two years of chaotic bungling, a, a plan was decided upon for a lock and lake canal. Only five votes in the Senate carried it over a sea level plan that would have almost certainly ended in disaster. Here you can see the, the American plan, with the controlling feature, a dam at Gatun. This was going to be something like half a mile wide at its base, the biggest dam ever constructed. This would make a lake, again, the biggest man-made lake ever at that time, 164 square miles. Its huge size, I'm going to just forward to slightly easier to understand map. Its huge size not only did away with much excavation, but also meant that even the worst Chagras floods could be tamed. And the river, from being the implacable enemy of the canal, became its helper, providing the huge amount of water needed for each lockage, something like 26 million gallons. So there you can see the, the bridge of water. There also remained the, the job of cutting through the, the continental divide coming down here. And this was a, a nine mile stretch, originally 270 feet above sea level, it needed to be lowered by this new plan to 40 feet above sea level. Something like three quarters of the canal's total excavation came from this nine mile stretch. It, working down here, it became known as Hell's Gorge. During the dry season, it would reach 120 degrees Fahrenheit. During the wet season, in one wet season, 10 feet of rainfall had been known to, to, to come down, making it a muddy nightmare. Within this nine miles, there were 76 miles of track, 160 trains, 6,000 men working, 300 rock drills. The noise and the dust and the danger was unbelievable. All this work really only started in 1907. 
At its peak, there would be 68 of these shovels, which you can see here working. And these shovels were something like three times as powerful as anything available to the French effort. They could lift, lift five cubic meters of soil in one go. Here you can see a picture from a little bit later on. However impressive and magic the canal looks now, full of water, empty, it is just on another level. I think, I don't know whether you can see that these are actually down here, these are actually people. It just gives you an idea of the scale. Something like um, massive amounts, something like 160 um, million pounds of dynamite was used. Um, and by this stage, there were a lot of people from all over the world coming to have a look at the canal. One observer called it the greatest liberty ever taken with nature. More, heroic, more than heroic human endeavor, said another, it was a geological event, simply the transformation of a mountain into a valley. But as the ditch was lowered, nature fought back. Massive slides added something like 25 million cubic yards to the total required excavation. At Culebra, the, the, where the, 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 the pass, and 75 acres of what had once been a town slid slowly but relentlessly into the canal. The problem of the, of the slide was partly due to the, the huge geological complexity of these mountains, due to the ancient sinking and rising of the isthmus above and below the ocean. There was also a string of volcanic cores and faults. This meant that some rocks, when uncovered, would react with the air, crumbling and collapsing. Other, other at some spots, hot steam would suddenly shoot out of the ground. On one occasion, the, the engineer in charge of this section was standing at the bottom of the canal and when in five minutes he rose up six feet as the, the floor rose as the sides pushed down. An American called it the land of the fantastical and unexpected. No one could say when the sun went down at night what the condition of the cut would be the next morning. Today you dig, tomorrow it slides, a West Indian worker said. A massive amount of spoil had to be removed, something like 262 million cubic yards. Now this was four times the original estimate the French had made to dig a sea level canal, and three times what had been required at Suez. This is one of the many ingenious devices that the American effort brought to the canal. This was a way of emptying the, the trucks with a sort of huge plow, which saved countless man hours. Here you can see steam shovels meeting at the bottom of the canal at, at its and designated depth in May 1915. Now, actually digging, digging the, the, through the Continental Divide was a massive undertaking, but it was essentially low tech. Building the locks was something completely different. This is the Gatun lock, and this was at the time the largest concrete structure ever built, and would remain so until the 1930s with the construction of the Colorado Dam. Two million cubic yards of concrete was poured here. And this was when concrete mixing was in its, in its infancy. Now it is a, a very exact science, but in the, in, at that time the ingredients were sort of thrown together and poured. Um, and, but the design, build and quality is evident with the fact that these locks are still working absolutely fine very nearly a hundred years later. Here you can see the lock gate at Gatun. Again, it looks so much more impressive before the water is let into the lock. Um, again, there was a lot of ingenious devices, including making the lock gates hollow so that they would at least some of their weight would be taken by the water. But with a few exceptions, there was very little of the idealism of the French period. In spite of the, um, in spite of the high pay and increasing material comforts, turnover of white staff stayed at 100% a year. The result was that in 1907, following a crisis after the resignation of the exhausted Stevens, coupled with criticism at home that the project was riddled with graft, waste and corruption, Roosevelt found it necessary to hand the project over to the army. Or, as he said, put it in the charge of men who will stay on the job until I get tired of having them there, or till I say they may abandon it. The leader of the military effort was, of course, um, George Gertel, seen here. Known as the Tsar of Panama, he had total control on the isthmus, every aspect of everyone's life. He ruthlessly defeated strikers, deported or imprisoned critics, and also kept the Panama Republic on a very tight leash. To outsiders, the new army regime seemed very strange. Everything was provided by the authorities, but you couldn't own meaningful property or vote. It was a million miles removed from the capitalist democracy back in the US, 
but such were the material provisions provided for the whites. By 1910, Rose Van Hardevelt would be able to write that she realized that the last vestige of fear and uncertainty seemed to have left us when our children were able to buy ice cream cones and soda pop at the clubhouse. Thoroughly at home, truly now a transplanted bit of the United States. For the black workers, of course, it was a very different story. Most of the labor force was from the small island of Barbados, only 10 miles by 20 at its most. Jamaica had banned recruitment from the island after the unhappy experience of the Jamaican workers during the French period. Um, the Americans, so the Americans established a recruitment station in Bridgetown and employed a steamer doing nothing but carrying workers from the island to Cologne. The journey took about two weeks and most of the men stayed on deck all that time and sometimes got hot enough to fry an egg on. They would have to be periodically hosed down to keep cool. The Americans offered 10 cents an hour, about half, what the, uh, half the minimum an American laborer would have accepted, but for the West Indians it meant for a 10 hour day something like four times what they could earn at home. The upshot was that out of a population in Barbados of 200,000, 45,000 of them went to Panama during the American construction period. One such um, was 24-year-old Harrigan Austin, who may or may not be one of these people on close-up. This is my third and final little mini-story. His Panama adventure did not start well. To raise the fare of $14 for the passage, he had to pool the savings of his extended family and took virtually nothing with him apart from his carpentry tools. He landed at Cologne, having had a hazardous trip of 13 days in bad weather, poor accommodation in general, and sparing meals on a crowded ship. We were all more or less hungry. We saw, after landing on the dock, a pile of bags of brown sugar, and the whole crowd of us, like ants, fed ourselves on that sugar. Austin was taken on straight away and loaded on with other men onto freight cars, treated more like animals than men, then distributed at various labor camps. His lot happened to be at Las Cascadas. Austin, already an artisan when he arrived, was deeply disappointed when he was put on the same wage level as the unskilled labor. Indeed, to some degree, life was a sort of semi-slavery, he wrote. There was no one to appeal to, for we were strangers and actually compelled to accept what we got. In the case of an argument, says Austin, the bosses and policemen, right or wrong, would always win the game. The West Indians were given less than a warm welcome by the locals, who called them chombos, and worse still, found themselves in the canal zone in a segregated system based on the Jim Crow laws of the Deep South. Every facility, from pay car to shop to school to drinking fountain, was labelled gold and silver. You can, see it, you can see here on the shop. Effectively, euphemisms for black and white. This is the way the West Indians were fed. Unlike for the whites, there were no chairs or tables provided, and the, and the food was really what was left over from the white hotels. There was no pretense of, of um, equal but separate facilities. For example, in 1909, there were about 17 pupils per teacher in the white schools. In the black ones, it was 115 per teacher. Unlike for the whites, no drying facilities were provided, and the result was that there was an epidemic of pneumonia amongst the black workforce, killing hundreds, while not a single white person died from the disease. In fact, the West Indian workers, who unlike the whites had no sick leave, were three times as likely to, as the others to die from disease or accidents on the works. Death was our constant companion, remembered another West Indian worker, Alfred Dottin. I shall never forget the trainloads of dead men being carted away daily as if they were just so much lumber. Malaria, with all its horrible, horrible meaning, those days was just a household word. There were days where we could only work a few hours because of the high fever racking our bodies. It was a living hell. Finally, typhoid fever got me. West Indians were given the most difficult and dangerous jobs, such as handling dynamite, as you can see here. One accidental explosion killed 23 and injured 60. One West Indian remembered seeing flesh hanging on the faraway trees. It was something terrible and awful to look at. The West Indian accounts are dominated by stories of accidents, usually involving the loss of a limb or two, and spells in hospital. Even as late as 1914, over half the workforce was hospitalized for malaria at some point during the year. Some 5,000 West Indians died, as well as about 300 Americans. But in spite of the discrimination and hardships, the West Indians also remembered their time on the canal with great pride. Carpenter Harrigan Austin 
writes about the untold benefit to the world at large that the canal brought. It is reasonable in any big war or any such projects as this, something will happen, he goes on. Some must suffer for the good and welfare of the others, for where there is no cross, there may be no crown. Thank God the canal has been finished and has become a blessing to the world at large, a great accomplishment, the work of a great nation. May God bless America. Other old-timers were less gracious about their treatment. One of our Bajan called Benjamin Jordan testified that although he had not let the discrimination take hold of him, there were now, at the end of his life, feelings he could no longer put in a corner. For my years with the Panama Canal, he said, there was a feeling I had not been treated as I should. I still enjoy life, like some of the others who survived, but the fact still remains, much blood was spilt and no one cared about it. But I'm still alive under God's care and will always remember the good that you do lives with you. It was perhaps fitting then that the humble pick and, it was the humble pick and shovel men who finally joined the two oceans. There'd been an elaborate publicity stunt organized whereby President Wilson pressed a button in the White House, sending a signal to Panama, which blew up the last remaining dike, and the hope was the water would rush through and clear the final slide that was blocking the canal. When this didn't work, the, the West Indian diggers started with a small channel, gradually widened it, and as the, the speed of the water coming through increased, so it washed away the slide and the two oceans were joined. So on the 15th of August, this is the SS Ancon passing the remains of that slide. There had been plans for a huge celebration with somewhat strangely warships of the great nations sailing through together to demonstrate global concord. All this was cancelled when the First World War started in Europe days earlier. It was sublime timing. Just the United States was, through building and controlling the canal, taking her place as a global power. So the old Europe of de Lesseps was embarking on a ruinous war. Now, a hundred years later, a vast expansion plan is underway. Here are a couple of pictures. You can see the, the new triple locks, which are going to be, the old locks are a thousand feet long and about a hundred feet wide. These are something like 1,400 feet long and 180 feet wide, making them um, just short of the biggest locks in the world. A current Panamax um, container ship can take about 4,500 containers. The new Panamax will be able to take 12,000. But the history still rhymes even today. There was, uh, when they were planning this, there was even talk of building a sea level canal, amazingly. Mm -hmm. And more than anything, there was this delicious irony of the bidding for the work coming down to a European-led consortium against US engineering giant Bechtel, who gave a high, if in their opinion, realistic price for the work. According to WikiLeaks, Bechtel are now standing by to step in when the Europeans make a disastrous mess of it, <laughs> as happened before, and looks like might happen again. According to the current plans, the expanded canal will deliver to the Panamanian Treasury in the region of $4 billion a year, many times what it generates today. I can't help thinking of the wishful thinking that has always been part of the Panama story. Patterson and Darien, money will beget money. The potential rewards are enormous, but so are the risks, as we have seen from the canal's history. As ever, controversy rages over every aspect of the process, as has always been the case in Panama. Let's see what happens. I wish them all the luck in the world. And I would also very much like to be able to answer any questions that you might have. Um, there is there's obviously huge expansion of, of the Miami port, but um, as happened with Flagler's Key West, um, the, ec the economics um, may dictate that the container ships or the cargo ships will find it easier to continue further up the, uh, further up the U.S. east coast to, to ports further north. I know that Cornelius Vanderbilt ran a steamship line in, in, through Nicaragua. The idea was to put a canal through Nicaragua. What was it that finally decided the canal would be in Panama rather than Nicaragua? 
Um, okay, how long, um, the, the question was, um, Vanderbilt had a, built a transit back in the 1840s, 1850s, um, that basically took you up that swamp at the San Juan River in Nicaragua, and, and then transported you across the lake and then down to the Pacific, or depending on which way you were going. Um, and there was a massive, it was known as the Battle of the Routes between Nicaragua and Panama. And, and this was a time when there was all sorts of shady lobbying going on in, in Washington um, to, to do with the, um, the desire of the French company to sell their concession and their assets to the US government. So they, through their lobbyists, they were putting huge pressure on for the Panama route to be chosen. Um, now the Nicaragua route was originally selected when this all went through endless committees because it was considered to be cheaper. But the reason why it was cheaper is because the French were holding out for $100 million. So when the French realized that they were about to see their concession become worthless, they lowered the price enough to make the Panama route cheaper. There was also all sorts of scaremongering about volcanoes and everything at, in Nicaragua. As it turned out, it was actually, it was one of the, um, President Roosevelt um, intervened in the canal story decisively on a number of occasions. One of them was persuading the committee to change their mind and go for Panama for engineering reasons. Main, basically, the, 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 the San Juan River was too windy and narrow for the kind of ships, the kind of huge ships that had been envisaged um, that the, the canal should, could, should be able to cater for. Yeah? Would railroads be a more efficient way to transport goods using the container ship concept for loading and unloading? Okay, so would, would a railroad across Panama and be a more efficient way than going through the canal. Well, interestingly, a lot of freight is, is now taken um, across the um, isthmus by the Panama Railroad in, in containers. Um, I think it's, a, it's about capacity and it's about, co it's about the cost of the canal. The, the tolls on the canal have been increased very considerably in order to help pay for this new expansion. Um, so the, it, it's become, the, railroad, the rail, rail route has become more competitive for that reason. The other, the other issue is, of course, that um, the, the Panama Canal is, or certainly was until recently, running at absolute total capacity, which meant that if you go to Panama now, you will see a long queue of ships waiting to, to enter the canal. Um, so, so there's timing issues as well. And but also the nature of the cargo. Container ships is one thing, but obviously sort of oil or um, grain or molasses or whatever it is. Um, it is going to be much more difficult to unload. Yeah. I remember reading a, a book about this and sort of mentioned that, that slides into the canal are still a problem. Are they, is that still an ongoing problem? Yes, I mean, I think in 1974 the canal was actually one of the very rare occasions that it was actually closed when a huge slide came down. Um, now, there was all sorts of things, sorry, sorry, the question was, are slides still a problem? Um, they, the Gertles tried all sorts of things to try and fix this problem of slide, including putting vegetation on the sides, um, concreting, putting huge nails into it. Nothing worked. The slide still kept coming down. But unlike for the French, the Americans by this stage, they had the muscles to just dig it all out again. So it just kept sliding, they kept digging. And if you go to, if you go to Panama, I, I, when I was in Panama, the first time I went there, maybe sort of eight years ago, you would see constant dredging going on. You have to constantly dredge out the slides that, that, that continue all the time. There's nothing you can do about it. Yeah. Who presently owns the canal? Um, well, the canal is controlled by the ACP, which is the, um, the, the canal body, um, and it is owned by Panama as a nation. Um, so a lot of the ports, the port facilities are, or until recently, were owned by Chinese companies. Um, and obviously there's, there's massive international investment in the, in the expansion plan as well. So, the, so um, the, the, the money, if you like, so who owns it? The people who own it, who paid for it? Well, that's that's international finances for, uh, finances from all over the world. What is the toll? Uh, I have done. Okay. The, the, um, the, the question was, what is the toll currently? Um, well, it, it varies enormously depending on 
what the cargo is. And the biggest toll I think ever recorded is something like $350,000, which was for a giant um, container ship. The lowest toll ever was 36 cents, which was for a man who swam through the country. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the average is about $54,000. About $54, Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Matt, for a perfect ending to this year's lecture series. It was a nice way to uh, conclude the series because, of course, Flagler announced publicly his decision to go to Key West when the U.S. announced its decision to take over the Panama Canal project. In fact, the Americans must have been thinking much as Flagler was when he was asked why he wanted to invest in Florida and develop Florida. He said, I wanted to see if I could succeed where the Spanish, the British, and the French had failed. Uh, in the case of the canal, maybe the Americans' view was they wanted to see if they could succeed where the Spanish, the Scottish, and the French had failed. But we did succeed, and uh, the canal um, was in our hands for some, what, 99 years until it was turned over some years back to, back to Panama. Thank you for that great conclusion to our lecture series, Matthew. I wanted to um, just uh, mention that uh, we have one more lecture this season that's not a part of the Whitehall Lecture Series, but is connected to our exhibit on the second floor at Tiffany Studios. John Loring, who was the design director for Tiffany and Company for about three decades, will be here to talk with us on March 22nd in the evening about Lewis Comfort Tiffany and the, tip, the work of Tiffany Studios, so you're all welcome to join us for that lecture as well. It will also be webcast in addition. I want to thank again our sponsors for this lecture series, um, the uh, Daphne Seabold George Foundation of Palm Beach Post. I want to let you know that Matthew will be here to sign his books at the back of the room if you'd like to uh, get one of his books and have him personalize them. I'm sure he'd be happy to. And um, I want to remind you all that these lectures are all archived online, so any of you, any lectures you may have missed, you're welcome to see. In a few weeks, we should have them all up and posted, and you are welcome, of course, to review the, uh, any lectures you attended. So, thank you all for being here this afternoon. Thank you to those who joined us online, and we hope to see you later in the season for other programs here at the museum. <laughs>